So that feeling of less rather than more of landing. I hope you like can remember that sensation like warming your hands at a fire, right? So like you know how to go right there. And of course, if you go to that place in your mind-body relationship, in some ways, it should already be true that your organs of perception are softening, <clears throat> right? So, and this is one of the big insights that I'm trying to get across to you is that, is that the instructions are just for your mind, but when you, like I believe that the, the subtler parts of you, the empty parts of you actually teach the yoga pose as opposed to just the instructions. The instructions are for your mind to be able to exert a level of control. But so when I say find that place of letting go, I'm hoping that over time it becomes, you know, that feeling is the same as softening your jaw, your temples, your face, right? Like those, that there's actually something that occurs when we explore that part of the mind-body relationship. And I think that's really an important feature about asana is that on some levels, you know, if you think about my story, I teach, you know, adaptive students, whatever that means, but I also teach traditional students. I call you all non-traditional students. I call myself a non-traditional student. But I also teach, quote, traditional students, meaning people that can jump and walk around. And the reason why I can do that is not because I've done every pose I teach. And it's not because I've learned to parrot, parrot all the words of my teacher. It's because the poses write themselves. Right? The actions, when you start trying to feel them and be more integrated with them, the yogic instructions that you've heard from yoga teachers that have been passed down for a long time are actually continuations of certain sensations. <clears throat> so again, as you pay more attention to your exhale, so I've now given you all these words, so now you're kind of more in your brain again because you have to listen to me, right? So let that go again. I remember it was a really big instruction for me that it has a version of listening too. Um, instead of just softening the base of your tongue, which is a good one for your inner ear. My teacher one time said, resist any urge to even contemplate speaking. Lips together, teeth slightly apart. Do the same with listening. So let the sounds come to you. Don't reach for them. Don't try to interpret them right now because you know I'm already going to use weird language. Right? Just feel. And then the beginning of asana is the beginning of the inclusion of body within that sensation that's way deep and subtle, but really nourishing. It's not just deadening. It can be nourishing. So feel your feet and your sitting bones. Can you learn to move in multiple directions while not disrupting the relief of that place? Can you learn to fold in the lifted chest into that sensation? Sometimes I lift my chest to create the sensation, but in centering, I want to fold it in like I'm adding ingredients. Let's call it cookie dough today. I usually say the soup. I'm adding ingredients by lifting my chest. I'm beginning to ground and activate my legs. Find the balance on my sitting bones. But I'm trying to stay connected to that other place 
that's actually another place that's so directly here, it seems like other. It's not other, it is. And then if you can bring your hands into prayer to use more symmetry and alignment, I'm not gonna, cause I'll throw off balance. Cause I know balance is more important than physical exertion. So I hope from the last couple of classes, you're paying more attention to the exchange between you and the universe on inhalation and exhalation. Something draws toward you, is appreciated, and then moves away. And there's a constant movement of exchange. Re-soften the jaw, the inside of the mouth, lift the chest. Upper thoracic, migrate it forward. Down through the sitting bones, down through a little bit more awareness in the legs. Feel the space between your ear and your shoulders. Feel the whole room from the stability of your body. Use your skin to sense the whole room. Connect and stay grounded. Connect everywhere and be grounded. Let go of your day. Prepare your mind to do yoga. Repose, don't forget your body. Don't let the emptiness become static, weighted, heavy. Good, and then release. Let the reins go. Palms up on your lap, but now like, a, like a, a plant coming out of the ground, from your base, from the earth, lift your chest. Drop your chin in humility. Activate your receiving ability. That's a bandha. Raise your head up with closed eyes. Open your eyes. Isn't it funny how, and I don't even regret it because it's really powerful in a lot of ways, but we have this human tendency to make everything a competition. So like even pranayama, which is one of the most absurd things I've ever heard. The ability to breathe, control breathing or eliminate the impediments to breathing, which I like better. The idea that that could somehow be about how big a breath you can take how long your exhale could be. Like it's a goofy manifestation of human, what competition, trying to control, trying to feel self-worth, right? Even if you're not trying to win, your breath will treat you the same. It will come in, it'll come out, right? The real quote competition is can you receive it? Can you get everything? I like to think of it this way, like you and I and the historical Buddha and the Dalai Lama and Thich Nhat Hanh and we all get the same 24 hours and seven days a week. We get the same opportunity here. It's whether you can actually hear and receive it, not collide and control it. Right? What if all your actions, even the ones that are more physical, could be nonviolent? Right? Like, how would that even look? How would that be? Like, like, could you actually make 
And this is part of the message in the Bhagavad Gita. Could you act so? Remember Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita in chapter two doesn't want to go to civil war with his brother, right? And he's going to have to, he's a general. He's going to have to enter the battlefield. And he's like, I don't want to. And, and Krishna says to him, this is just the story of the Bhagavad Gita, whatever. It's like, you know, the story of Genesis is just one of those stories that you learn from or you don't. You get to decide what you take from the stories, right? And Arjuna says, well, you, it's not for you to choose. You actually have to live in the time you are. You actually have to pick up this glass of coffee, iced coffee, which is my lifeline this morning because of a crappy night's sleep. So it's like, you don't get to choose. Oh, no, coffee's bad. It's bad for me. I should live a more enlightened life of just pure seaweed or something. And the answer is no, actually. It's how you drink the coffee. It's how you transform the time you get. It's all about the how. Control comes from the universe or people trying to tell us it's about the what. It was never about the what. Did you get a deep breath? Did you get a this? Did you get, did you do But No, it was always about the how. If you wanted to like move through the world more aware, right? So asana is an attempt to like show you how your movements can be more congruent with stuff. So I'm, you know, I know when I want you to receive from the empty space right behind your back. So one of the lines in the centering I said is like, don't let your, I don't even know if I use this word, but let the space or the emptiness be heavy, weighted, right? That's, if you unfortunately have a neurochemistry in your brain, some people can't hear the hem emptiness without it feeling heavy, right? That the way that they receive that energy makes it a deadening sensation rather than an aliving sensation. And your habit to that, it's a habit how you actually practice it. Sometimes if you have the wrong, I mean, I know some people that just, you can tell from the time they were born, they battled with the emptiness as heavy, as opposed to as light. Like, I think it's literally how they're like configured, like their cells or something, right? So, but, I, but for most of us, there's a choice. You get to figure out, and I, you know, I'm not always battling depression, but I know this emptiness. So do you. You know it because you live with a disability. You know it really well. Right? Can you invigorate it? So sit up certain and tell again. And what if there's so much already going on by sitting up certain and tall? Remember last year, I think last week, was I talking about my hula hoop? Does anyone remember this? The hula hoop that from, from Never Cry Wolf. So here's my hula hoop, right? I get to occupy the space I'm in and touch almost directly the space around my body. And I actually touch more to the hula hoop around me if my chest is lifted as opposed to collapse, collapse it, pull away from the world, right? This is good for pain relief sometimes. This is good sometimes, right? This one, you're gonna receive more life force. This one, your mind's gonna be more activated. I don't know why. Doesn't mean I can't think hard when my chest is dropped or I can't live well, my chest is dropped, means I don't receive as directly. So much of the asana is a maximization of, of connection, right? Not of an avoidance of disconnection, but being able to take the energy of emptiness into your action. So I know some of you, I almost want to turn this into a discussion, but one of you wrote, gave me feedback last week, and I'm about to use names, so um, that in class, you see you're struggling so hard to physically do what I'm saying. Does anyone else try to get, like my words get lost because you're trying so hard to do stuff with your body? No? Do you, yeah, good, well, good. Well, that's just so that, but, 
but like the idea that it's not about what you achieve, it's about how you move. There is nothing simple about that insight. That was a lifetime. That'll be a practice. That won't be a realization. That won't be a intellectual thought, right? So start moving on your sitting bones again, because in other words, sometimes I want to just give less instruction and say, okay, wait, wake up the lightness in your body. And then you figure out how you want to move so that your body isn't a bringer of static energy but is actually got the lightness folded into it. And I find, especially on Mondays, that I need to open my chest more, like do kind of some gentle, good feeling back bends. And the side to side, it's like, yeah, that's good. You know, but then well, if I do it in rhythm, another thing happens, right? Like rhythm here too. And then open and closed right or forward here when i'm forward i feel the earth more i'm more inward i don't look skyward some things change right can i find strength while i'm forward right so how do you find strength when you're forward like this in a forward bend well you better activate your base you better figure out how to have your legs elongate your spine don't just collapse in it right so you're making this strong i just planted both my hands on my knees to create an even better more ferocious base right so my arms are like i'm the sphinx a little bit i'm ready to leap with my chest right i'm ready to go up and open an upward facing dot right? But I'm doing it from a really strong base and then release. Now I go back over my chair. And it's like base has changed here. But what, how can I keep connected to the earth? Some of you that have been, you know, started yoga before you had some sort of disability and then come forward and contrast it with the forward. Right. Maybe you've done the classes where you've done a lot of back bends. And if you do too many back bends too willfully, they make you shaky as hell, right? And it's because you forgot the earth in your back bends. Right? You didn't let the earth come through you. You got all caught up in the back bends. So I'm, I'm contrasting this expansive feeling that gives me my center, my chest into the world. But this isn't just the answer. The answer is also to come forward, find the earth, look down, find more base and become a channel for the earth, right? While letting the sky come down to the top of your head. What? What the hell are you talking about? talking about everything good and then release right everything up over so i was watching i was watching a documentary inhale lift up exhale i was watching a documentary on frank lloyd wright I'm sure most of you know, if not all of you know, he was a really good architect, but a serious control freak. And then come back, like you bought, you bought furniture. And if you, he was known to design a house, build all the furniture, leave, come back years later, sneak in your house. And if you'd move the furniture, he'd move it back to how his design was. That's who that guy was. And my God, the spaces are beautiful, right? You've got, in Frank Lloyd Wright, you got these modular kind of lines, like modern lines, but you go inside and the spaces are beautiful, except you realize he got to the beautiful spaces from too much control. So he doesn't like his beautiful spaces. I don't know if I'd want to live in a Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright house. I'd like to visit it for sure. I would pay money to see the beauty, but I don't think I'd want to live there. Yeah, same with Asana. 
right? Don't over control everything, come over to the side, but believe in structure, right? <clears throat> Inhale, lift up, exhale, fall. So I'm just adding to this forward and back and then back to center. So you got the forward again, the grounding, finding the strength, rising up, back over. My spine's getting an expanding diet of energy, right? And I come back in the center, then I take my arm up and I'm gonna add the thing about this is like a different vegetable, right? The twist is like a different vegetable to your diet. Right, inhale, lift up, exhale, revolve. It's like, wait, I need, I want all of these sensations. I want all of these energies in my spine. Take the other hand up, exhale, revolve, right? Lift in the car bones, roll the shoulders back. I'm kind of purposely not giving you a lot of instructions because at a certain point, I want the pose to show you the instructions. Of course, my knowledge can help you deepen a twist, right? Of course, I can actually give you words for that, for sure. But remember, at the end of the day, I'm trying to help you practice on your own, right? Like, you know, I love giving you instructions. It makes me feel like I'm really smart, but really, the magic is in your practice, right? <clears throat> so just on a, you know, like inhale, lift up. So if I want to have the earth, so I'm going to be lazy here and keep my arm kind of bent and my, sp my spine dropped and there's nothing wrong with this except... If I want to have this, the earth and the sky in my pose. So I'm straightening my arm, not just to straighten my arm. I'm hitting down through my base and through my opposite sitting bone even more. So I can become a conduit. Even though this is a strain, I'm trying to find how I'm a conduit. Right? How things are traveling through me and then release. So when you start, to, and that, that's why you roll the tricep in, you drop the shoulder blade down, you go beyond your fingertips, you don't over, over, uh, over exert if your name is Pat, right? Yeah, you go, yeah. And, and then down, like I'm trying to figure out how I'm a conduit, but a conduit for what? What are you trying to be a conduit for? In, what energy? Come forward again. Huh. I'm a conduit for something, damn it. So the yogis got so excited about being a conduit that they developed these, uh, this idea about nadis. In other words, like these energetic lines that connect more and then come on back. And when, when they could connect and seal these nadis, into certain positions, then they felt like they were getting more energy from the universe, right? That they were actually connected more, right? So you're trying to figure out, so this, one of the reasons why I try to keep, when you're sitting so much, as I do at least, and you just, I want more, I wanna not forget my low back. I want space in my low back so I can be a better conduit. So I can receive more from the emptiness rather than just from my accomplishment. So I'm lengthening my low back right now. I'm leaning forward if you can see me, right? I'm still on the column. Oh, there I am. <laughs> That's how I went off screen, right? So I'm, I'm constantly hitting down my sitting bones, lifting my chest, broadening across my sacrum, grounding my hands on my legs and taking a few breaths because I wanna make sure I can feel the ways in which I'm a conduit, not just a doer. But when I'm getting more connected, so I can feel the muscles working to hold me in place for sure. All right. So I'm gonna watch my breath, watch what happens on exhalation, watch what happens on inhalation. And I'm gonna call this quiet energy strength. The merging of the quiet energy with my effort is the source of my strength. Good, and then release. So last week I was talking about 
the the um, you're not a drop in the ocean, the entire ocean in a drop. I want to give you the same energy, but with different words. That you're both a singularity and you're the whole, right? So one of the things that asana tries to do is help you access that place. Another set of words or description would be where there's an unchanging part of your experience, even while everything else is changing. There's a singularity part, even when everything's in chaos or changing, right? Even when you're part of the whole. So have you ever asked yourself, why do we clench our jaws when we're stressed out? Over grip our eyes, tend to, I mean, like, well, let's just stay with the jaw for a second. Like when you watch someone and when I'm always seeing the person that's sitting in a, at a meeting in a group whose jaw never stops working, right? I know that person's holding off where the lions are, right? They're actually trying not to, trying to like, they're trying to go, mm, I'm gonna stay focused by clenching my jaw. But so what do you get when you clench your jaw? And we know this is not, you know, in general, you don't do yoga poses like this. But human beings are smart, relax your jaw. So what I would like is everyone to ask me what they think you're getting when you clench your jaw, right? Clench it again. Let's call that access to the singularity. It's just in a self-destructive way. You get at, when you hold your breath too, when you're stressed out, you tend to hold your breath. You get access to the static energy that's here. And somehow that helps your mind a little bit temporarily. So these habits of holding your breath and clenching your jaw under stress are actually doorways. They're just self-destructive, right? Self-destruction is a doorway, right? It, it gets energy here that normally wouldn't be here. And then a depressed person is getting access to that energy and it's feeling heavy, right? So let's move again. So obviously I want you to like now undo, you over clench your jaw so things shut on itself, right? So now open your mouth, let your tongue out, move your jaw around and go, God, I got to undo that. How about people that never know they're clenching their jaw? They're never doing the undoing. Oh my God. I know there's some people on, on the, that have mouth guards and that grind their teeth at night when they're sleeping. Yeah, you're accessing the singularity. You're getting control for your mind at the price of your life force. Right? Kind of weird when you think about it. All right, inhale up, exhale over. Again, this is an energy that I kind of want you to fall in love with. Twisting energy is really good. It's also very cleansing, right? But you got to find all different ways to twist, change your leg positions back to center, right? But you're, you're actually exercising your spine, right? You're actually adding a different energy to the sensation in your spine. But God dang, any one of you, when you've been doing yoga, have you thought, without really knowing you're thinking of it, if you hadn't gone to this class that you kind of think trink, twisting farther would be better. That's the competitive part again. Like what the hell? Why would I think more is more? And then come back to center. In fact, you notice with the beauty of a sunset that you, you don't get more of the beauty of the sunset if you stare straight at the sun, you actually burn your retinas, right? You have to take things in, not always so directly. All right, forward, finding the earth, lifting out of the earth, coming back, going up and over. Forward again, popping up pop up this time. Don't go so freaking slow. Come through and under. 
like you dove quick underwater to surprise your your sister or brother when you're little in the plain water stuff and then back through so i'm going slow i'm going to go slow and all of a sudden i'm going to accelerate as i come forward and go over and under fast because why wouldn't you and then you're slow again and then you come through and you go over under fast and then back through right because i want to change speeds right i want to change speeds one shoulder forward one shoulder back right wait and then maybe a fast one and then a slow one right and then maybe come forward again and instead of fast make it slightly more sensual right so you're going from side to side and you're like oh that's a good energy right so you're trying to vary speeds sensuality right will all these things in movement right so now i want you to take up more space legs wide because like you know like i i've said i wrote in waking but i don't know if i wrote this line in waking but being in your whole body and living in more spaces is actually your birthright right as long as you have a body right your body gets to expand so again, I'm sitting with my legs wide just because quite frankly, mostly during the week, I don't sit with my legs wide nearly as much as I sit with my legs together, right? So I wanna balance it out. So if I'm not gonna do this position as much where my legs are wide, in the time that I'm in this position, I better learn to receive it better, right? I'm gonna work on the how, because I'm not gonna get as much of this, right? Trying to wheel my wheelchair around with my feet off my pedals is a is a losing proposition, right? It doesn't work. I just cut up one of my toes that way this weekend. It was bare for my foot came off, right? So it's like, so I don't, I want to keep my, for most of my day, I want to keep in line here. But I'm going to actually take some time, I hope you do too, to not be bored with the different world that's opened when your legs are wide. So how can you make it more yogic? Well, of course, you know, I'm gonna teach grounding, right? Find your sitting bones, lift your chest, find your inner heels. Now, I'm gonna to work to point this knee out this way, right? First, I'm gonna, maybe you can't even see it on the screen, but I'm pushing it out. So my spine is literally trying to scoop underneath my leg because I'm paralyzed, maybe you're not. Right, but I'm trying to get my spine to express itself out through my knee. Then I'm gonna go the other way, and go away. Then I'm gonna notice, whoa, one side of course is way better than that. So here I had to change my leverage points to get energy moving out through this leg. Right? Some of you sometimes should practice while putting having your legs wide and having one up on a chair. So it's in a straight line. But I'm, I'm gonna go out through that leg and then I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna go through, out through the other leg. So I'm spreading across my sacrum to go out through my femur bone. So remember, the subtle body intersects the physiological body at the diaphragm. I'm gonna go back to the other side. Remember, you have a diaphragm here, here, and here. So when I'm telling you to extend out through your sacrum or spread your sacrum to extend out through a knee, I'm giving you an instruction that's at the intersection of different seas of your, of your body. One more subtle and energetic or one more physical, right? I'm gonna stay in the middle here and grounding exactly did that kind of art. And then I'm gonna always believe in variation, right? So. Like in a yoga pose, you always come back to Tadasana between standing poses. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to actually notice the contents. I'm putting my knees in. Why? Instead of letting my knees fill out right now, I want my knees coming in. Why? So I can feel this energy of my inner thigh coming right up through my spine. 
So there's nothing wrong with this. this is I live all day long. This actually focuses my energy a little bit more. So someone like Michael on the screen, you need to practice more of the legs, knees going apart because Michael's in this energy a lot where his knees are together, right? So you gotta, so, but I'm, I'm because I tend to have my femur bones roll out, I'm doing this to actually receive energy into my spine. And so if I'm doing this to feel more energy in my spine, right? So maybe you're not paralyzed and you think, oh, this action's stupid. No, actually the action's not stupid. Your mind is dull, right? Like you, you might, it might not be as big a fireworks. This is where I have an advantage over you. I don't, I hear this as fireworks because I don't have as much access to sensation as you do. So I can, but I want you to know that this is nourishing. This is Tadasana. From Tadasana, lift your chest. So your knees are slightly together or you're giving them reference. You're keeping, you lean forward and you lift your chest and keep your elbows back. And this is a good time to breathe because I'm breathing right through my midline. And then release. So now that was just a dose of Tadasana between standing poses where my base changes. So spread your legs again. So for those of you that know Warrior 2 or Virabhadrasa 2, right? Um, you, although this isn't exactly the position or the alignment or anything like that, there's you, you bend your, you stand with your legs wide and then you bend into a right angle. So you, you kind of let this femur bone go out and then you, you heel below it. So you got a right angle. So when I was telling you to spread from your sacrum out through your knee, that was the front leg in Virabhadrasana 2, right? The thing about Virabhadrasana 2 is that as a student goes out over the bent leg, they tend to forget the backside. And without the backside, this pose is worthless. So instead of like worrying so much about how far forward I get here, I'm gonna make sure I extend out from my sacrum, out through my knee, as I keep my back hip grounded, my torso upright. So I'm taking a picture right now of what it is to be extending my energy, my spine energy this way, grounding my back hip, lifting my chest, but gently letting my sacrum come forward into my spine. So you're at the core of one of the standing poses. right? Now. And then release. So I needed this extra grounding. Everyone profits from it. So you're going to do the same thing. Ground here, extend here. I'm even pushing on this leg, but I'm trying to extend from the sacrum. But I'm as I extend from the sacrum, instead of just going by sacrum out this way, I'm making sure by grounding my hip, I'm making sure I stay on this side of my sacrum too. So I stay in this leg too, as I lean slightly over this way, right? And now I'm gonna take my arm line. Now I'm gonna put my hand, my head and chin in line with the femur bone. And I'm gonna make this a full expression. Good, and then release. I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. So does anyone have, does everyone have an image of Virabhadrasana too? You kind of know what that pose is. I could find it in a book here quick, but we'll wait, I'll show you after. Well, all right, so we're gonna go the other way. So remember, we're trying to extend out through this knee, but as my mind tries to control that, I tend to lose the connection to what's behind me. So I'm gonna ground my back hip as I extend energy out. I'm even like pushing on my skin, right? I wanna like get this energy going this way from my spine as I keep my back hip grounded. I'm doing it on this side with my forearm, right? And so I'm trying to get this separation of intent, energy between my finger bones. So one going down towards the earth more, One's going away into the world. So I'm splitting my spine between my femur bones. And I'm taking a picture of that. Good, and then release. One of the things I often like to say is that 
It's just a coincidence of evolution that our spine split in two and became legs. And then it split in two and became arms. Right? It gave us an advantage to only have two arms and two legs, I guess. But it could have been way more. Right? So I'm going to go back to the first side again. I'm going to be extending out through this knee, grounding the back hip, lifting the chest. I'm going to take this arm up behind me, right? And I'm going to use the wall here. Oh, that helps, right? Because that helps me keep energy going this way. So I'm, I'm trying to get the back femur bone, this hip down, this hip reaching into the world, my back arm staying grounded back, lifting my spine, bringing my sacrum forward into the pose, lifting the collarbones, and breathing as I look out over my bent knee, Virabhadrasana two. Good, and then release. And then of course, back to Tadasana. I wanna go right back to what I think is the energetic gas pump. I'm gonna bring my knees down and go, oh, relief back to my spine. Right? As I keep this midline an expression for my spine. When my knees like roll out, the energy of my spine rolls out like waves and it dissipates too fast. When I keep this alignment, I get more nourished, even though it takes effort. So I'm just going to sit like this for a second. And then release. So one of the advantages that we have as students, because our bodies maybe don't work as well as every, you know, most people's body, is that as long as we can believe and have the strength to know, not just believe that, that it's not just your imagination. So let's take your legs wide again. Because there's prana everywhere, right? My mind gets the empty side of prana. My body gets the full side of prana more. Right? So I'm doing this pose. So in order for me to extend out through this knee, right? Keep this hip down. I could, and this is what, what I think is distracting for an able-bodied person, is they think those two actions are just physical. Right, that they think about extending the knee in, in very wrestling too, you'd be extending down to this leg and pressing down to the outer heel, right? And they're thinking, I'm just gonna work on that physically. Well, yeah, but your poses won't become graceful. You'll become sculpted, right? But that's different. So, so I wanna, as you extend out through the bending knee and stay back through this leg, where are you accessing that awareness from? If you can't physically do it fully with your body, right? So I'm going this way and down, down and extending out this way. My spine is changing through each femur bone, right? Is expressing through each femur bone. But where does the wholeness come from? How can I do that? Right? And the problem for an able-bodied person is that they actually think they can physically do it. And that's the end of the story. That's the beginning of the story, not the end. So in order for me, and then I can take my arm back as an expression, look out over my front hip. So, and then back. So I'm trying to be, as I take my arm out and my chin this way, I'm just trying to add frosting and ice cream to the cake, right? I'm just trying to get more of my body in this multi-directional pattern, right? For someone like Gay on the call that can't do as much, she's having to access the pattern, not just with her imagination, but with a sense of wholeness. So singularity allows me to press down on this leg, extend out, I start to feel the particular. Now I'm gonna take my arm back, but I'm taking my arm back already. 
because I'm letting this whole part of me be part of the pose. And then my arm, and then turn my head. I'm challenging the shit out of my mind right now because I'm trying to stay back here and go this way. But really, I'm just trying to keep my spine moving through both femur bones down to each foot. Good, and then release. The thing that I want to try to get across is that your sense of wholeness, and we're going to do the other side in a second, your sense of wholeness comes from the unchanging part. The unchanging part is the wholeness. Right, so I'm going to come over this way, press out through this, this femur bone, doing very vibrasana too, down through this hip. Like this energy already just makes my spine want to jump, right? So now I'm going to take the arm back. I'm going to use the wall again. I'm going to like it. I'm going to turn my head. And I'm going to have my spine go in every direction like the Vitruvian man in Da Vinci's drawing. And I'm going to do it not just through my effort on my physical body, but connect, get my mind quiet, quiet enough so I can feel the space underneath my back arm, the space behind my head. The space behind my head makes me ground on my sitting bones. Right? The empty spaces teach the pose. Good, and then release. So unless you've been doing yoga for a long time, that line may go, oh, whatever, he's just talking weird again, right? The empty spaces teach the poses, not the instructions. So come back to Tadasana. Come into that gas pump, however you do it. For me, it's bringing my knees together. Lift my chest. And when I do this, when I bring my knees together and lift my chest, I, get, I start to get why sun salutation matters so much, right? Because it's making my midline have all different movements and shapes, right? So back to the forward again. So now, instead of being forward so serious, be happy about it. Here comes the earth. Focus on it. Don't let it be heavy. Lift out of the earth as if you really could come out of her soil, right? Lift your spine up and then take your head up. Look up, but don't strain your neck too much. Try to keep the back of your neck length. Take the shoulder blades down as the sternum lifts up. This is an energy wavelength that I want as part of my life. Right? And then I'm going to go back. And then I'm going to, as soon as I figure out where I'm going to hit the back of my chair, I'm going to shift gears and fall open. And I'm doing it slow at first so I can appease my mind thinking I got more control. All right. And then grounding up, 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 and I'm going to go skyward here in a second. I'm going to keep the earth this time as I go skyward. Falling in love with the sky is actually as dangerous as never getting out of the earth. Right? Oh, now I'm going to start to speed up because I want the variation of speed. Right? And then I'm gonna, different parts of it, I'm gonna go extra fast. Right, don't get too dizzy if this is getting you dizzy, right? I'm varying different speeds, right? And then I'm coming back in the center because I'll never forget when I heard the instruction um, <clears throat> from my yoga teacher in Virabhadrasa 2, Warrior 2, that was, she said, well, when you descend into the right angle, she said, your femur bone is moving faster than your knee. 
It's like, come on now, what the hell? Like I'm going down into right angle with my knee and she's telling me my femur bone's going faster than my knee. And I gotta try to figure out what the hell she's saying. What's happening there? If my femur bone's going down as something's holding me back or going slower. So two different speeds are occurring. And why would the two different speeds be important? Well, I'll give you a word answer if you want. You gotta figure out what it feels like. This is a brilliant instruction. And it's in a lot of poses that you're moving at different speeds. Do I think that I'm actually moving at different speeds? No, like if you were to mark my body, I'm taking my legs wide now, take your legs wide. If you were to mark my body, right? That on the outside, my legs going at the same speed as I'm leaning this way and pushing out, right? But if you go inward and know that as my knee's going out, by pressing here, something's drawing back. So I'm extending and something is trying to keep my container as I move into it. And when I try to go realize that there's this and there's a this. So typically in a yoga class, we'll say, in a traditional class, I'll say extend from the, the inner groin to the inner knee and draw back from the outer knee to the back hip. That's just bullshit. I mean, that's a way to try to pretend you have control. But the point is, even in a movement of extension, there's multiple directions going on. There's different speeds going on. So I'm coming forward, making sure I stamp my heel as I broaden across my sacrum and release my groin towards the knee. But I'm drawing back at the same time to help the back arm. I'm going to lift my chest. Why? Because I get the hole. W-H-O-L-E. Good. And then release. So I hope you're not just imagining your poses right now. I hope you're doing them. So again, I'm going to come the other way. And I'm going to figure out how to let something fall faster, move faster as something holds me back. And I'm gonna be grateful for what's holding me back, not just what's opening up. Because that way this back arm isn't alone on an island. So I'm extending through my sacrum out through my knee. Something's drawing back and it's supporting my back arm. Oh my God, when I get my back arm better, my knee goes down farther. I can feel it, they're connected. That's the whole, W-H-O-L-E. That was the purpose of asana, is to realize the whole is accessible in every pose. When I give you so many instructions, and then come back in the center, does anyone have a tendency to hold their breath? Right? You're accessing the unchanging, just like what you do when you're stressed, right? So it's not, you don't want it like, so it's one of those examples, right? Of you're doing something to help your yoga pose that gets you access to a dimension of your pose, but unfortunately is self-destructive. How many habits do you have in your life that make you feel better that are self-destructive? coffee and excessive amounts. There's a lot of them. Staying up too late. It's one of my favorites, right? I got all these things that I access energy through something that's slightly self-destructive. Hmm, what am I accessing? How am I doing it? That's the question, not should I do more? So sit up straight and tall. As you sit here and start to center to come towards Shavasana, 
you want to make your body feel whole, which is kind of the same as a singularity. You're feeling alignment so you can feel your feet and your sitting bones. So you're kind of coming into what can receive. So I'm gonna very consciously figure out how to lean back against my chair so I can receive. I'm remembering the class right there as I move my head. So the whole class comes into Shavasana, right? I'm visiting everything I've done without having to think about it. That's the beauty of the body, right? It's got it all in it. Lips together, teeth slightly apart. I want to make sure this stays light. So I, like I say, I always lightly touch my fingertips together to make sure I'm not just falling, but I'm also rising in Shavasana. It's a balance between falling inward and accepting outward. Soften around the jaw, the temples, the inside of the mouth. Release the weight of your body without collapsing all the way. Feel your breath, don't change it. Practice being an observer without change. Thank your body, thank the emptiness, be grateful for the fullness. From that place, gradually increase your inhalation just slightly. And then let your exhalation wash back, wash back into the ocean. And inhale again, and when you're ready, open your eyes. Just for a second, try to synchronize your vision with a gentle inhalation and a gentle exhalation. Good. When you're ready, and if you can, bring your hands into prayer. Namaste. Spirit of me, Buzz, the spirit of you. And, and, you know, I hope that this sense that um, ultimately on some level, the singularity and what's the wholeness 
are actually the same. And I think it's really freeing when you realize that your stress habits, clenching your jaw, holding your breath, are actually access points to the unchanging energy. It just happens to be that those access points, the doorways you're choosing to get there are self-destructive. Right, so you start to realize that, wait, the energy, the, the unchanging part that I hold firm with and get defensive with when I'm stressed out, that part's important. Learn to have it while you're breathing and not clenching your jaw. Right, so it's like, you know, one of the lines I really like that I say is that we are intuitive truth trackers, right? So when we're clenching our jaw, we're not just being stupid. We're accessing something, right? When we're not breathing as fully and as, as well as we could, that's always going to be the case. Just practice it a little bit more than a little bit less more, right? Don't think it's all or nothing. That's purity rights. That's purity bullshit. That's competition, right? It's like, no, it's not always about more. It's about realizing what's happening. And that everything you do, your mind-body relationship, your brain has figured out a reason why. I've, I've learned this over and over from people with disability is that any of their habits that look like they're not great habits are actually problem solving at a subconscious level. And you better figure out what they're solving. You clench your jaw and press your tongue through your mouth because you're accessing something that your mind thinks helps, right? And it does help if you could not clench your jaw and still access it. That's what yoga is about, right? All right, hands together. Namaste, spirit in me, buzz the spirit in you.